Shine your light.
we're going to just share a little bit of, uh, of a trip that four of us just took, as you just saw there, to Kenya and Uganda, Africa. And uh, we just want to share with our church family a little bit today about what God showed us and, and uh, what God continues to show us when we do that. I told the first service today, I, I'm a Southern Baptist preacher's kid. I grew up in a, in a home where missions was a big part of our home. And, and uh, my, my dad had been on, on multiple um, home mission trips and, and then in the United States and had done several different things. And I don't know if some of you old school Baptists will remember or not, they used to have this little <coughs> devotional thing. It was a little loaf of bread. And there were little uh, pieces of, of um, scripture in them. I don't know if you remember those or not. And, and at dinner, we would uh, pull out a scripture. And on the front would be a, a scripture verse. And on the back would be like a missionary. So we would read the scripture verse, and we would pray for the, the missionary, and, and uh, you know, for as a kid growing up, you know, I just I want to eat, I want to go and play, but my dad thought it was important to to do that. Well, my dad also, you know, as the pastor of the church, because um, he loved missions, had lots of missionaries come in, and I was subjected to. I say subjected to because it wasn't my first choice, and uh, but uh, many missionaries would come in, and they would play their slides and. And they would talk about their stories, and, and uh, they would share about their experiences and everything that they'd seen and heard. And I'm just back there going, ah, why is that so boring? <laughs> and I kept thinking, man, I just, when is this going to be over? When can I go back outside? Uh, the world was too big for me. The world was this great big place, and only the super Christians, just the super apostles, went and did something like that. Uh, I would never do that. I, I, I don't have the diet for it. I don't have the money for it. I don't have, you know, you make all these excuses. And I told the first service also this morning, I said, be careful when you use a phrase like we sang in the song, Oh Lord, use my ransomed life in any way you choose. That's a dangerous prayer to pray. It's a dangerous thought to think, much less to sing out loud and to share it in front of other people. And and um, and so about 10 years ago, I met Bill Brent and, and through Capella Outreach International, we began a relationship with him. And then when we planted the church here, we wanted to support uh, that work, that mission work as global evangelism, uh, the care for an orphanage, the, the planting of churches, the training of pastors. Uh, but it wasn't until two years ago that the world was brought right here for me. Uh, and I got to go over there, Jeff Fields and I got to go over there last year, and it really just upended everything for me. And I told you last year, I came back with my calling confirmed. I'm not called to evangelism, I'm not called to missions, I'm not called to worldwide travel or anything like that, for sure I'm not. My calling was confirmed, the church is my love, the church is my home, the church is the local church right here in this community, in this country is where God has planted me. But I will tell you this much, I can't think of the gospel, I can't, I can't plan to share the gospel, nor can I administer the gospel without seeing those little black faces in my mind. The pastors that we got to meet there that are struggling on the ground with trying to figure out how to take their limited knowledge and bring the gospel into a world full of tainted at best, but most often miscommunicated tips as sharing the truth of who Jesus is. So we went, four of us this year, before I get the guys to come up. I want to show you a few other pictures. Chaz, if you put that first picture up here uh, on the board for me, uh, just so you know, if you are completely geographically challenged, and uh, some of you are, we won't point out names or anything like that. This is my pointer state. All right, so this is America. Everybody recognizes America, right? right. So we flew from Nashville to Atlanta, and then a long flight over the pond, the big pond, to go over here to Amsterdam. And then a long, another long nine-hour flight down to uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And then we spent the first four days, we traveled, we got three whole hours of sleep in uh, Nairobi, and then immediately got up and jumped on another small prop plane and flew into Uganda. Uh, we flew into the southern tip of Uganda and then had about a six or seven hour journey, uh, shoulder to shoulder, hip to hip, cheek to cheek, so to speak, uh, in this unair conditioned van. Uh, six of us in this thing, and uh, all the way up to 
the Kiryandongo district, uh, Boyale, Uganda, a very rural place. The city itself of Boyale probably has total 100,000 people when you pull them all from in these remote villages and everything. But at this given time, at this time, in this place, in this world that we live in today, there's much persecution, there's war, there's genocide. And Boyale, Uganda, the Kiryandongo district, is home to over a half a million refugees from South Sudan, from Somalia, from Rwanda, from the Congo, Ethiopia, some from from northern Kenya, uh, seven countries, and again, over half a million that have descended in this district of Uganda. Our goal was to go into this city, into this district, and to preach to their churches and, and their pastors, encourage them, equip them, uh, really come alongside of them, and then at night, we would hold a massive crusade of just Everybody come. And I'm going to show you some pictures of that in just a second. So we travel from all this place. Show me, give me the next one. I can't remember which one's next. This is our team. The white guys are from America. All right? <laughs> Black guys are from Uganda. Uh, the one behind me there uh, to the right of Big Papa is uh, Pastor Eric. And he is the right hand man. He is the, uh, the liaison for Compel Africa. And he sets all these trips up and, and all this. The one you don't recognize in the front row is the Raging Cajun from South Louisiana, uh, Gary Hanbury, and uh, good, good, good brother. Uh, so going to the next one, uh, this was our, our ride everywhere we went, sometimes six hours, sometimes 30 minutes, sometimes one time 10 hours, and, and uh, traveling back over the border into Kenya, a uh, very uncomfortable ride, but that was, that was it right there. All right, next one. Yeah, I told you it was close. Uh, you can imagine traveling, traveling to Nashville and back, maybe in close quarters like that, but that was on our way uh, on a 10-hour journey to go from Uganda to back to Kenya. Uh, it was a long ride, a uh, very long ride. You have to get up and stretch and realize there's parts to you that you didn't know that could be sore that are sore. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, all right, uh, a lot of rural traffic, but then you're going through cities where there's four, 500,000 people. And there's usually only two lanes on the road and usually about five or six lanes of traffic on two lanes of road. And that includes cattle, uh, goats, any other kind of livestock you can think of, and then all these cars, big and small. Go ahead. This was the first church that we attended. Again, one of the main responsibilities that we had there was to go into the church and preach in the church. This would be considered uh, one of the nicest churches in their entire region. Uh, mud bricks. Dirt floor, show the picture of the inside, Chaz. Uh, that's it. Uh, no HVAC units anywhere. It's just uh, whatever the weather is you experience. It was about 86 to 88 degrees during the day, but in the shade, it was somewhat tolerable. Now that tin roof, uh, if you're blessed enough and have enough money, you can put a tin roof on your dwelling. That's good when it rains, but it's not very good uh, when the sun is just beating down on them because it's a hot box in there. Uh, what's, what's this? Yeah, this is us preaching with our interpreters. Like that, we couldn't hardly repeat after each other in English. 
there was some language barriers. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, primarily with our more redneckiest. <laughs> this uh, on we're standing outside that church, and you can see the 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 grounds back there in the back where the crusade was going to be. The crusade was originally intended to be in the middle of the city, 100,000 people and a half a million refugees. Um, they found out that we were coming about a month or two in advance, and the Catholic Church, and I can't remember the other one, there's a Catholic Church and there was another one that went to City Hall and told them about it, and so the government bought the land and put something else on it before we could get there. And so we had to cut out some room, well, not we, <laughs> I wasn't there when they cut out, you were there. <laughs> and it was cut out when we got there. So they had to cut out a section of the cornfield uh, and harvest that uh, before we got there to build uh, some space for it. You'll, you'll get to see that in just a second. But uh, some amazing things coming from that because when the people come to these grounds, they don't drive. Uh, they walk, and they walk for miles and miles and miles. If you know anything about Gallatin, it would be like walking from here to maybe the Kroger, Kroger Marketplace, not the one here in the city, but on out there off of Nashville Pike and Cage's Bend. And, uh, and when this thing is over, you'll see in just a second, uh, it's dark. It's really dark. And I think three of the four nights, it rained. I mean, like monsoon sideways rain. After we left the grounds, they would continue on singing and worshiping and praising and the rains would just come and just flood the place. And then they would walk home, soaking wet. And they would walk home to a mud hut, a grass roof, and in the complete darkness in Africa. Uh, just just floored us. Uh, what do I have next, Jess? If people ask where we stay. We had, we had a really nice place to stay uh, in these first four days. Uh, uh, really an oasis of sorts. Uh, we were not expecting uh, this to be this nice. Uh, go ahead and show the next one. A nice little porch area, and then the next picture, you kind of get a better, better look there. Yeah, that's where we ate, and then those, those are the lodging places next door. Uh, no air conditioning anywhere, but very, very comfortable surroundings there. Funny, though, because uh, Billy had to pack an extra suitcase for all the snacks and stuff that he brought. And when we got here for our first night, we realized this was such a nice place. To be, and man, we ate pork chops, and we ate chicken, scrambled eggs and bacon for, for breakfast. They even had French toast one day that was like real French toast. I mean, this was the Taj Mahal of, of refugee camp uh, life, you know, so to speak. And here we are, and man, they just wanted to do everything for these uh, uh, six Mazuka's uh, white guys that, that came over here. And, and so we were getting this and so in the meantime Billy's just like handing out snacks left and right he's tipping the driver he's tipping the server he's tipping everybody that came and made his bed I mean just everything just giving them out I mean some precious ones see those little pink wafer cookies that I mean he went into the vault <laughs> and got them and giving away all kinds of slim gems and stuff unfortunately for him the next place that we went was not quite so nice and then he was missing all these snacks that he had but they took really good care of us and uh, we had really good accommodations for the first four days. And then it, it got a little rougher after that. But go on to this now. I think we're getting ready to... Yeah, people asked if we were safe. Uh, we do have armed guards with spike strips and, and AK-47s there at the gate where we stayed. Uh, felt comfortable of sorts to have somebody guarding the place like that. But in another way, that we had to have a guard uh, like that. It's always in the back of your mind that as to what could happen. Uh, but we're making our way to, to the crusade grounds. I want to show you some of that. But uh, remember I talked to you about the locusts when we were talking about the plagues in Egypt. And I was talking about, you know, in America we have these little grasshoppers. We don't really call them locusts. They're just little grasshoppers. But Jeff Haley, the bug man, was telling me about in Africa they have these African locusts that are considerably larger than what we have here. And I took a picture as close to what I dared to do because I think he could have flown away with me. But I got close enough to measure it. He was about the size of my cell phone. So I didn't want to put my hand up that close to me. <laughs> I didn't want to like chew my finger off. But, uh, but he was about the size of my cell phone. That's how large and how long he was. And so when you think of billions of those descending on uh, Egypt at that time, you can only imagine uh, the terror that would have been. What will I have next? All right, this is on our way to the crusade, our first night for the crusade. They've been hearing about us. They've been promoting everything. 
Again, we've had to move out of the city and now out into the, the, the country a little bit more. Uh, but we were getting thousands of people that were coming. And this is our first, first entrance into here. Man, were they excited. Two hours before we got there. So they've been singing and worshiping.
came uh, just so joyous and so fun. Go ahead and go through these next ones here. Anytime we saw a Faith Church shirt or one of those kids, we had to point them out and make them feel special. We were very proud, proud to see them. This is when uh, Lexi uh, Crump makes all these little rubber band bracelets for them, and uh, they each got to come up one at a time and pick out two for themselves. And for some people that just don't have much, these are really just huge gifts for them. Let's go ahead. This is when the letters that you wrote, we were passing out the letters. Uh, you all wrote letters, and uh, so we called them up by name, and they got to come up and get a special letter from somebody in America that wrote to them. And so they wanted to tell you something in return. Go ahead. Thank you, Faith Church. Thank you, Faith Church. They are very, very, very pleased to get that. I'm going to ask our guys to come forward if they would. And, and I just want to hear them, uh, let you hear uh, their, their heart and their perspective on, on some things about the trip. Again, understand that this is... Uh, you know, one of those things where we show some pictures, we say you just kind of had to be there, and it is, we, we understand that, but, uh, you know, people ask us all the time, you know, why did you go? What did you see? Uh, what impacted you the most? What, what was the most uh, near and dear thing that, that was a part of you? I just wanted these guys to come up and, and share for a little bit about, um, you know, the things that they, that they saw and got to be a part of. And, uh, we've, we've really kind of bonded together a little bit and anytime you take a trip of, of that length uh, these two right here have uh, become bosom buddies they sat shoulder to shoulder held hands every once in a while and, and uh, that was okay yeah it's, it's, it's what we see so Jeff let me start with you man people are asking us questions all the time um, you know about what we did what we ate where we stayed and, and all that stuff but um, one of the things that they always ask is what affected you or what was maybe your favorite part, and then what affected you the most? Yeah, I think seeing the Crusades was, was pretty cool. It was about four, three to 4,000, you know, over mm -hmm. 1,000 got saved. Uh, you don't see that every day, right, here in the States. And, uh, the children, the orphanage, <coughs> there's so many things. Getting to go back the second time was, you know, was really cool. And it was really different each time you go. So it's like we talked about, that after the best in the blood, right? Mm -hmm. But it was good. A lot of those things, and you now God just say, God, we've got yeah. Tell them about when we first came in, the kids were like, oh, they yeah. remembered you, right? Yeah, I remember Chris and myself, and you know, just kind of grab your hands and just hold your hands all the way back into the world. And so that's cool. You can't talk about the kids very much without getting all no, emotional. What about you? Now, <laughs> let me, I don't even know how to introduce him because this is Darren Kennedy. For those of you that know, this is Darren Kennedy. <laughs> and so we get over there, and the first thing he does is we're introducing ourselves. He says, hey, I'm Mark. And we're like, Mark. Mark. He says, I'm Mark Derrick Kennedy. And I thought, all right, well, why are you Mark now? And you weren't before. And he said, I thought it would be easier for me to memorize. And so to some people, he was Mark. Some people, he was Derrick. We weren't quite sure how to use him. So, Mark Derrick, what the heck you So, as you can tell, I got caught everything over there. <laughs> so, but, you know, I'm going to start out by saying that I praise God for giving me the opportunity to go. Uh, I'm thankful that he allowed me. And also, I want to thank all of you for all your prayers because there was not one time when we were over there that we were scared, we were nervous. We, we felt safe and you know had so much comfort and, and peace about us. And I want to thank all of you, and plus many others who, other churches that was praying for us as well. It was really a, a big thing. And, uh, you know, I was really thankful for all that y'all done. Um, the thing that probably touched me the most or impressed me the most, to be truthful, is everything. Uh, I've never been a part of anything like that. The land was amazing. The people were amazing. We went over to serve people and wound up being served ourselves. So that was kind of humbling for me. Uh, the crusade, can't say enough about the crusade, it was, well, I mean, if you look at each other, look around the room, every night, that's how many people came up to accept Jesus Christ or more. Um, I think the last report was 2,300 and something, I think is what we were told that accepted Jesus Christ. And, you know, you just can't really imagine or fathom 
you know, people so willing, uh, so hungry for Chinese life. Uh, that really touched me hard. Plus, you know, just for me personally, just being over there, it gave me a glimpse of heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were seven different countries represented at the crusade, and everyone worshiped together. You know, we don't see that here. So I'm grateful that I was able to see that, you know, over there. Um, also, God's Word came to life to me. You know, when you read one day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, I can see it. And, you know, it, it's still, I'm, I'm still overwhelmed with it. I hadn't even soaked in everything that God's going to show me or show us. Uh, I don't know how it's going to impact our lives. My hope is it not only impact our, impacts our lives, but you'll hear something that will impact yours as well. Um, the orphanage, of course the orphanage. Oh man. The kids were so incredible. We pull up in a van. We get out. They run to you. But they don't just run to you and look at you. They run to you and, come on, Billy. But, I know. But they hold your hand. You know, and, and a girl that I sponsored, man, every time she'd grab my arm, grab my hand, and the first thing she'd do, lay her head on me. And man, it just, you know, it just break your heart because they were so loving, so receptive. Even to a point that whenever they celebrated birthdays, which they had to do in a group, because they only went, you know, compelling goes back every, uh, like three times a year. So the kids who got birthday gifts always shared it with the other ones. And, you know, our kids over here, they get a birthday gift. No, it's mine. You know, don't touch it, stay away from it. And that's with everything that they have. So. I guess my answer is everything. I mean, really, I'm still overwhelmed. I, I, I can't even do justice to what I've seen. And uh, the, the kids really equate their sponsors because they're orphans. And some of them have never known a parent. Some of them would remember a parent, but most of the ones that are there, their parents died uh, either from AIDS or from some uh, violent encounter somewhere. Uh, and they've been without parents for a long time. So they equate American sponsorship as parents of sorts. So you come over there, uh, whether you write a letter, uh, if you were to send something, like send a gift, uh, they take it as like a parent is uh, really just showering them and, and uh, they're very affectionate. What about you, Sweet? Yeah, the orphanage uh, for me was, I mean, the crusade was awesome to be a part and to, to see that many people flock a cornfield and walk to church uh, and to know that we cut on the Weather Channel here and there's a cloud in the sky and we decided not to come. Uh, so just the commitment of people to worship the Lord was the overwhelming thing that I saw. Uh, and then the other thing was, again, the orphanage to see the kids uh, come up and run and go, explain to me who you guys are. So I had to explain who you were and what you do, and and, uh, and they would just be so awestruck at knowing that you wrote them a letter or that you cared for them and you sponsored them. Uh, because your sponsorship, you become mama and daddy to them. Uh, and I think the one of the story that got me was uh, Elvis came up and uh, I was showing him pictures on my phone and showed him Darren. And he said, oh, Darren. And he knew who Darren was and then I flipped it to Landon and uh, that's Darren and Amber's son. And he said, oh, my brother. And he pointed out to Landon. And I, I just had to get up and walk off. Uh, because that kid, for the first time, he could point to an American family and go, uh, my daddy and my brother. And they love me because they sponsored me. That, that guy. And, uh, and that was the way Sebastian was with McMurtry's. Uh, just overwhelming the support that you guys give. You think you just give it to an organization and you never see the fruit of it. Wrong. They know exactly. Everybody was waiting to pull one of us offside and go, tell me who Miss Carol Bosco is. Tell me who uh, uh, Stephanie Mock is. And they wanted to know who you were. Next time we go, uh, for all of you that are sponsors, I want to get your video and a picture of you. I'm 
because they were asking for that over and over. What do they look like? What do they like? And uh, they were wanting to know what uh, you know what you do. They they've asked us. You know, we've we've got of course a million stories to tell you, and not enough time to do it today. But um, we went last year, and I've been thinking about it for some time, though, Jeff. But what compelled you to go? What what was it that just said? You got to do this. Well, like I said earlier, we had to get Billy back home. Was one of them. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Uh, no, I, I think you know the whole point of going back, uh, seeing the kids, and then the whole the thing was a whole new experience, right? And I think it was for you because true. Last year we went on mobile crusade, so we went to village to village, and this time the village came to us, right, at the at the crusade. So I think that you know just getting back over there, seeing the kids, my, I got three, and that whole experience. What was it though before maybe before we even went last year he said, I'm gonna take this American businessman. He's never preached a sermon before. He's traveled some internationally on business, but never in a thing like this. What what was the sense that said, I've got, I've got to do that, I gotta go? Yeah, you, you get God's calling, right? So you can either deny it or you go. <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> He's trying to get me emotional. Uh, it takes this, it takes this much effort. It takes this much effort to get him emotional. I mean, you know, you, when you're growing up, you hear about, you know, you got to get all that film to play, right? There's a thousand kids in Africa starving. I don't know if you heard that when you're growing up. I did. I'll tell you, that's not true. There's a hundred thousand kids starving. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true. Jeff was originally signed up to go with us, and then because of some work conflicts, wasn't going to be able to go. And uh, we were sad, and we were trying to think of how these three stooges were going to make it uh, along with him. Stuff worked, and he was able to work it out with work to where he was able to go. And there was much rejoicing uh, that went on when he was able to go, not just because we were glad to have a buddy, but our families were like, yay, the smart one is going with him. <laughs> Jeff's the smartest one of the group. He's the fastest walker of the group. He's the most... OCD of the group. <laughs> he pays attention to details. And he makes sure Billy really didn't not drink nothing but bottled yeah. water and nothing but towels. Yeah, because you can't just, you know, go, go yeah, and do everything. We, we were in our church and we got to go and Billy and I got to go together and we we're in Pentecostal church and a very active church. And it's the first time I experienced Pentecostal church. But Billy was there and it was hot. It was just really hot. It was hot. <laughs> and, so, and basically, Billy gets down first and they bring this water. And he said, you can't drink it if it's not sealed or whatever. You know, and he said, I'm going to drink that water anyway. <laughs> so it's that kind of stuff, you know. You just got to be careful while you're there. We, we did drink nothing but bottled water. And I think Brother Gary from Louisiana had some, uh, a little bit of stomach trouble because he ate some stuff over in Uganda, right? But, but yeah, so it was pretty moving, you know, at that church and stuff. And, and uh, we saw God. And it really tells because I get emotional about when we're out there and there's a dark courtyard and we're looking out the doorway. We went into this church, in this Pentecostal church, and me and Jeff, they had us at a table. And he came up and he said, who goes first? And so we kept waiting because they were continuing in their worship. And so we saw a chair sitting by the door, and I kept looking. I said, that's odd that there's a chair by the door. And uh, so we just kept sitting there, and uh, it didn't take five minutes for us to look up and see a guy. He was about that tall, grown man. Uh, his legs were deformed, and... Uh, he, he drug himself to church. And uh, when he come crawling in, I about lost uh, And I sat there and I went, oh my goodness. So they walked over, the ushers walked over, picked him up and set him in that chair. And uh, and it, it was overwhelming to me to see him drag himself. And you had to cross a bridge to get there, a wooden bridge to get there. So it took him that long to drag himself inside of the church. And then we left, Jeff took his hat off and said, here, put this hat on me. And uh, he gave him his best hat. And, uh, but it was overwhelming to see, again, the commitment to be in God's house. Yeah, dude. To come that far and to go through such adversity to get yep. there. Uh, like you say, you know, we, we tend to take that for granted a lot. Uh, I think Darren said something in the first show, or maybe you said it before, you see the poverty. <laughs> Um, you expect the poverty, then you get there, the poverty is more impoverished than you could have ever thought. Uh, you hear about certain things, and then all of a sudden it becomes to, to really sink in with you. When I told you uh, before that Africa is starting to get into my bones a little bit, it, it is the whole atmosphere of it. Um, and, and it is something that I think we're going to definitely be 
making many more return trips too because there is a work there that I think we're going to get to see move. Uh, it's not just showing up to a place, um, building a building, saying hi to everybody and then moving on and coming back next year and then building on an attachment to the building. It is, uh, you're going into places where there are no buildings. You're going into a place where there is really nothing. They're gathering together in a cornfield and uh, people are, people's lives are being changed. It's, it's really incredible. There, say, same question for you. Um, what was it that compelled you to want to do this in the first place, man? I mean, where did it start for you? Well, for me, there's multiple reasons. But I guess really it started March 4, 2001 when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I told him that I would go wherever he would send me. And, you know, since then, or after that, I started praying for God to allow me to see through his eyes and to break my heart for what breaks his. And, uh, you know, I knew that was an answered prayer for me going to Kenya and Uganda, you know, I knew that would be an answered prayer. But also in, in being real, because I think it's important as believers that we're real, we're honest and upfront with each other. I realized too that I'd become complacent in my walk with Christ, that I'd taken things for granted. Um, and, you know, part of it I blamed before I got to faith on a church hurt. But praise God for reconciliation because God reconciles. All you have to do is do your part. But in saying that, I've become stagnant. Uh, I knew who I was in Christ, but that's as far as it went. Uh, so, really, that's... I just knew I had to go. Uh, yeah, I was really impressed with, with Darren in, in regard to on Sundays we were going to split up and everybody was going to go to a different church to preach. And um, and, and I don't know how it worked out this way, but, but Jeff and Billy were going to go to a place and then me and Darren were going to go uh, to, to another place and their one sermon is just not enough. Amen? No. <laughs> uh, you got to have two or three different going. And uh, you hadn't had church until the third guy's gotten tired and uh, you got to you know, bring the singers back. But, the, um, but we went to this one place and where, our, where our colleague Gary was supposed to do, he got sick, like Jeff said, and wasn't able to go. And Terry said, I'll go. I'm like, dude, you're, <laughs> you're in the construction business, man. You can't go in there and preach all by yourself. You know what I mean? He's like, I'm, uh, I'll go. And so Derek gets out of that van all by himself into just a sea of Africa. And he goes into this church, doesn't know a soul. But, of course, he sticks out because he's different from everybody else and they would expect it. And I don't know what they're expecting from today, they're, whether they're expecting Big Papa, whether they're expecting me, or, or maybe it's a letdown if, if it's not Big Papa that comes to their church. But in walks there, he doesn't know anybody. And they set him up a little perch over there where he's the honored uh, guest of the day, and, which kind of unnerved him a little bit. But uh, tell him about Pastor Jackson. Well, once again, it's amazing how God works and how He brings you comfort in many different ways. There, there I was. They ushered me to the front. They gave me this nice cushy chair. And I didn't want the cushy chair. I wanted the hard seat like everybody else because I know who I am. Uh, but thank God for Christ, right? So in saying that, you know, things are going and I'm enjoying the service. I'm worshiping with them. And right out the corner of my eye, I see Pastor Jackson, and I've met him the first day, and he comes up there and he comes sits beside me. Wow, all of a sudden, I know somebody. So, you know, it, it becomes more peaceful inside of me. And uh, in saying that, he asked, he said, hey, will you pray for me? So, you know, we prayed, and uh, after we got finished praying, they called me up, and you know, you missed it earlier. The first time I preached, <laughs> Chris uh, was able to point out I had 106 pages of notes. <laughs> and as I walked up there, man, they fell out everywhere. Because I tell you, I was nervous. I've never preached before. Um, but what Chris didn't know, I didn't sleep that night either. Because God was stirring in me something that I felt like, or he, he felt like, they really needed to hear. 
So it just kept going over and over and over and over in my head. So here I am with no sleep, get up there and drop all my notes. So they pick it up and they help me out. I have a good picture of this, <laughs> but I we had talked before we left several times about what to expect and, and to have some notes about like this, is, because we may not even have a, a stand or a pulpit or anything. We may just have to open our Bibles and go. And so he gets up there and he's got like, uh, nine or ten pages of just loose leaf, loose leaf papers. And the first four, I don't know, it looked like more than that. It went a lot and it hit the ground. Yeah, and so the wind blows the first one off. The translator has to bend over and pick it up for him. And so he finds a little, he's got the pulpit stand there, and then he finds a little place, a little inlet there where he can set some notes down. And then some on the top, and he's got some in his hand. But he can't. He can't figure out which ones he's preaching for, so he's holding these, shaking these at the people, but he's preaching from the nose down here. <laughs> he'll look at that, and he'll get up there, everybody, and then he'll change hands, and then he'll look at this, but these aren't the ones he wants, so he'll put those down and pull those up and start preaching down from those notes here again. And it was the funniest thing. He didn't even need any notes. And it didn't need them. He just kept, and like I said, the Lord had really yeah. uh, gotten in his heart and, uh, and made up. Well, I think what well, the notes, was special. The notes were a security blanket that really I didn't need. Because um, that Sunday that I was allowed to preach and Pastor Jackson came up, well, I didn't have any notes. I had scriptures written down and somehow I memorized them. I don't how that works, but God does. So, you know, He worked it out. But in saying that, whenever I was finished, I just felt compelled to give my Bible to Pastor Jackson. So I wrote a little note because I really wanted him to remember me because we, we kind of struck a bond. And, uh, you know, who knows? I may never go back. I, I want to, but if I don't, at least he has something to remember me by. And of course, I was apologizing. I'm like, man, I'm sorry. It's all duct taped up because it was my favorite Bible. You know, that's one I use at home all the time. And I shared with the, you know, the first service how I'm just now starting to write in my Bible. I really, really have trouble writing in it because I find His Word pure and holy. And you know, I feel like I felt like I was defacing it, but now I realize that that's not the case. It really brings scripture to light as well if I just write in it, and, it, and also I can remember things a lot better. So I was telling him that, and uh, I, I said, "It is all right if I give you this." And he looked at me and said, "Yes." And then, man, he just he just broke down. And he told me, "See, he didn't realize he was my miracle that day, but he told me he said." This right here is my miracle. The Bible I've given him, he saw was a miracle. Something that I take for granted. Something that I have five or six of at the house that I might not even go through three or four of them. But he saw us as a miracle. And, and as a precious gift. And the thing is, really, it's God's Word. It is a precious gift. And uh, He came up to me. Uh, actually, we were riding in the van to lunch afterwards. And, uh, and I was pointing out his Bible. I said, man, it looks like you've really been in that book right there because it was all duct taped together and everything. I said, that looks like a, a near and dear precious book right there. And he opened it up and marked the word, uh, Mark, there, whatever your name is. <laughs> Mark had written a, a note. He'd written that note and it didn't dawn on me for a second. And then I looked at him again and he said, yeah, Mark gave this to me. And uh, it was just so special to see, uh, man, you, you let go of that fear, you let go of those excuses, you let go of those I can'ts, and watch God be put things together, orchestrate together like that. It was just a, uh, a really, really cool, cool day, and I, I was certainly commending him for, for that. Uh, study Bible over there is gold nugget. Uh, I, the church that I preached in, again, you have to preach just about three times there was a guy that but one of their primary influences in that country unfortunately is TBN Trinity Broadcasting Network they're flooding the place with uh, with all these preachers with Creflo Dollar and, and Benny Hens and, and all those guys and so they try to emulate them they don't have an ounce of depth to them whatsoever but they try to pattern themselves so they get up and they preach 
like the TBN preachers preach. They use the same lingo, they use the same language, they use the same mannerisms, and, and you just see that. And so the third guy got up and he was preaching, basically re-preaching my sermon. And, uh, and so he's going up there and he's doing all of his antics and things like that. But he doesn't have a Bible out. And I happened to look over where he'd been sitting, and his briefcase was there, and his Bible was sitting on the seat, and I just kind of looked over. And there were some words at the top of it that caught my attention. It said, the New World Translation. And for those of you that don't know, the New World Translation is the Jehovah Witness Translation. So he's reading out of the Bible, studying out of the Bible, preaching out of the Bible that denies Christ as God. That, that belittles the reality of the personhood of Christ. So he's patterning himself after this person, reading a Bible that has been so tainted and so uh, uh, just torn apart by man. And I'm like, how, what, 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 how can we touch that? How can we give something more? And so to know to walk out of that service that day with that burden on my heart and realize that, uh, man, he's giving his hat away. He's giving uh, a Bible away. Billy's giving food away left and right. I mean, it's just... Uh, I mean, it's just amazing. It starts getting into you. You can't help it but want to share with them. This guy, um, I, I don't know what it was uh, that, that compelled him, so I'm going to ask him the same question. But uh, being a Gallatin boy all of his life, never really leaving the state, but a few times, uh, everybody going, why in the world are you doing this? What is... Billy really Fugue, we're going to do in the middle of Africa. What compelled you to go? What made you want to say, yeah, I'm going? The biggest thing for me is when something's always laid at your feet, it's you must soak it in prayer. And when it was approached to me, the first thing that came out of my mouth was, no, uh, I don't know those folks. I don't have any dealings with those folks. I don't work with those folks. Man, they stay over there. The Lord planted me right here, and this is my mission. And it's hard to say missions when you don't understand what God's doing all over the world. And we would come in there and BBS, and I would have the kids in here, and we would do a uh, our, our, our international missions project. We would take up flip flops, we'd take up toothbrushes, we'd take, and so that began to come back to my mind of, man, I'm taking all these things up for kids, but I really don't understand who they are. And so I remember. Uh, I, I began to pray about it, and the passage that always came to my mind was my favorite passage, Galatians 2.20. Uh, me being crucified in Christ as I who no longer lives with Christ who lives within me. And so when I remembered that and began to meditate on that, it hit me one Sunday morning sitting there on that front row singing that song, uh, All I Have is Christ. And when we come to the lyrics, it says, Use my ransomed life any way that you choose. And the Lord spoke and said, how can I use you if you don't want to And I began to just weep unconditionally on the front row and I said, yes, I'll go. And the comforts that we have here in this church, and man, it gets comfortable as Christians to, to come into this building and have our air conditioner, we can adjust it. I just didn't know what that looked like. And so for me, I had to go and experience it and see it because I wanted to see what God was doing all the way over yonder. And that's a word that they don't understand. No, no, no. So, uh, I figured that out about two minutes into my trip. So, I, I wanted to see it, uh, but the Lord compelled me to go. And uh, and when He said go, I go. And uh, and I made that pact same as you uh, 11 years ago. And so, I just felt like the Lord said go. He wanted me to see it, and I was changed uh, for it. So, it's interesting when you start hearing everybody's path to get to where God wants them to go. They are all, all different, but yet they tend to intersect all in the middle of God's will and what He wants for them. And, uh, and so we had just a, an incredible experience together. And, um, definitely, we want to, when we talk about going again, uh, you know, if you're interested in anything like that, it's expensive. It is, and it's time consuming. And you may have to take that vacation time that you've cherished and built up and, and, and use it for that, whatever the Lord may be asking you to do. Uh, but, but please hear us. We're not coming back and saying you're less a Christian if you haven't been on a global mission effort. Because your primary, and I'll say this a hundred times, I'll say it again, uh, your primary mission field is your home. If you're married, 
your spouse, if you have children, your children, if they're in your home, if they don't know the gospel, if you're not bold enough to share the gospel with your children, if you're not bold enough to share your faith inside your home and your family, and you're going to have it this week, almost all of you are going to sit down with somebody, some friends and family, and share a meal, and you might go over what are you thankful for. And you're going to list a bunch of things that you're thankful for. Uh, maybe you don't have a family that, that's like that, but you're going to be confronted with lost family members. You're going to be confronted with people that, that, that might be asking questions and what will you say to them, what will you tell them. Um, so the mission field starts here. And so when they ask us, man, why do you go all the way over there? Why do you spend that money? Why do you go to such effort? Why do you go to such extremes to go into the middle of Africa, for goodness sake? There's people, there's lost people in Nashville, there's lost people in Galaxy. And that's true. And uh, next week, uh, for those of you that are new, uh, we do preach right here. Uh, and I'm going to do that next week. And, uh, and I want to share with you a little bit more about where that compelling comes from and uh, what the, the need for it, the necessity for, for why we do that. So for you guys, for our church, how can faith be a part? Uh, we told you about sponsoring kids. You become like a parent to them. You could write three, four letters a year and send thirty dollars a month, and they will think you are mm -hmm. the best thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ever got to go over there and see them, then it just made a lot easier to that. And um, so consider it. Um, you know, we don't have a table where you can pick up a kid or anything like that today. We're not talking about that, but uh, but you can go on the website. We can help navigate that for you, and uh, and you can do that. It's just so simple to do, and, and it is. We're just testaments that they're. They're, you're making an impact. You are making an impact. Uh, going there is one thing. Sending stuff is another thing. Praying for them. Uh, you know, the church being able to send some money to them every month. And, and Mike and the mission team is, is uh, proposing this next budget to even up that effort even more. Uh, we're examining that tonight as trustees and elders. Um, how can we be more involved in that? Uh, don't want it to just be a signature on a check. I think that was one thing for me. I was curious enough to want to see it. And uh, because of your help and your prayers, we were able to do that. So, so thank you to the church for praying for us and for supporting us and being there for our families while we were gone. Uh, I know this is a, a, an atypical, it's, it's not a, the, a normal type of service, but I appreciate you listening. It's important for us to bring back a report for you so you know what God's doing over there. So you see what God can do. It's just really useful, you know, vessels. You know, there's nothing special about any of us up here. Uh, but there's really something special about when we open our mouths and Christ is heard because He's in the gospel. Christ begins to speak through us. Um, I'd love to show you that someday. I'm going to ask our band to come up and uh, we've prepared a little song and dance for you guys. <laughs> Y'all go far away from the microphones if you don't mind. <laughs> now, we just uh, want to close with uh, maybe this song of, of commitment, of, of prayer, of thanksgiving to the Lord. Um, just ask you to be a part, to be open. If you sense God telling you, move, then move. If you sense God sensing, telling you to stay, stay. If you're questioning some things, wondering, you know, what do I do with this? I'm not. Trained. I'm not talented. I don't know what to say. I don't know where to go. I haven't started. Uh, man, we'll help you with all that. We will. And, uh, and God can use you. Young or old. Uh, experienced or inexperienced. It doesn't matter. Uh, God wants to use you. I remember, I'm not going to give credit to the author, but most of you will know who he is. Um, in the 80s, there was a song uh, called Thank You. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm a life that was changed. The song pictured uh, this man walking through heaven and different people coming up to him and going, you don't know me. But I was in the back row when you preached on that. You don't know me, but I was, uh, I was over there when you gave something and it allowed me to hear the gospel. And I can't imagine that one day that we might be strolling through the streets of heaven and a little black face comes up to me and grabs my hand and says, let me show you around. I'm here. Because you said yes. I'm here because when, when the Lord said, Whom shall I send? You said, Here I am, I'll go. And I just, I can't stop thinking about him. 
I don't think of the gospel the same way anymore. I don't think of church anymore. I don't think of heaven as a bunch of white people singing victory in Jesus around the throne anymore. They may sing words I don't know. And somehow, we're going to know. And what I consider crazy, them jumping up and down and spinning all around all that, I'm going to be doing the same thing because, boy, we'll be unified together. So today we say, I'm going to make this commitment. Sing the gospel. And share the gospel. Wherever I go, America, Africa, Nigeria, or Nashville,